time come we joke around some more And since you're down there in St. Louis, was what happened in Ferguson a surprise? Because, again, you just think about, you know, history lives in the present. That's the sundown town. Think about all the sundown towns across this country. And, you know, black folk, you know, our families, communities, we talk. We know what the end, you know, we're the counter public. We know what's actually going on. I'm sure there had to be some conversations, especially among the black community. We're like, you know what? That's not a surprise at all, which always that uh, when you see our white brothers and sisters surprised shocked by these videos of cops killing and brutalizing people or shocked and surprised by Ferguson or the L.A. riots or elsewhere, as though this isn't predictable and this hasn't been a long time coming. It's not the riot psychosis. These are regular folks responding to car, you know, a carceral society, police brutality. But down there, like when you were watching it and talking to folks, were they at all surprised? Do you, well, it's kind of interesting. It's, they really were surprised. It's like that they from the Richard Pryor show called, you know? It's like black folks, yeah, I know it. And white folks, you know, I had no idea, right? It's the question is, are they really surprised? I was in the gym one time and overhearing the conversation between two older white men. They were complaining about the, uh, the rioting. You know, and they say, well, they don't really have to do that. They don't have to destroy property. You know, and suddenly I found myself yelling from behind my locker, man. Would you have paid attention? In St. Louis, you know, we had slavery. You didn't pay attention. We had lynching and Jim Crow, and you didn't pay attention. Redlining, and you didn't pay attention. And in all my adult life, I've watched the protests. I participated in the peaceful protests. Jesse Jackson, you know, I lived in Chicago, Operation Push, and Al Sharpton, and all these peaceful protests. And it wasn't until people started burning things up. And also, I making pretty pictures doing it. <laughs> you know, that's one of the things about the Ferguson protest, the images that came out of it, man. You don't see folks who make images. Only African-Americans seem to know how to make an image that stirs people. Now, I don't know if it's in the right way or a wrong way, right? There's a, a seductiveness to these images of people being bitten by dogs, <laughs> you know? But it's like, I've watched other people, other protests in other countries, and it's just, they don't come close to that sort of aesthetic dimension that makes people want to be there and want to be part of putting people in prison, drives, going through speed traps, you know, you go to court, and the only people you see, the only people you see are poor people being fined to the hilt and being imprisoned for not being able to pay for fines in all these little bitty suburban hamlets also in the city. So they pretend, at least they say they're surprised, but it's like you're saying, well, they wouldn't be surprised if there were populations being treated like this whom they thought were human. And for some reason, they think that we have just this inhuman level of tolerance and, and forbearance. You know, it's like, uh, you know, thinking about these minstrel characters, so Toni Morrison talks about the black nurse man. I teach this one uh, Faulkner short story. It's called A Rose for Emily. And this crazy white lady, she murders her lover and sleeps in bed with his corpse for like 20 years. The short story depends upon a kind of structure that enables her to be isolated from the community, but also be in connection with the community. And Faulkner does this through this manservant named Toby. And so I perform this, what I call a recentering exercise. And I ask my students, if you change the race or even the gender of Toby, even though the story is not about race, will it change the way that you read the story? And it's hard for them to admit that Faulkner assumed certain things about them as readers, that he assumed that they would never ask questions about Toby. When I read the short story, you know, I say, well, my grandfather lived in a house with a crazy white lady and her lover. You know, it's like, no, right? It's not possible. But only if people lend to character of Toby the loyalty of a dog does it work. And so you have these characters that are kind of like dogs, like loyal dogs, and not necessarily thinking, feeling human beings with intellects. You know, that's one of the things I liked about Glover, man. It's just like actually people who have intellects who are not just there as victims of suffering, but people who are thinking about responding to all the various situations. And you said suffering. I'm thinking about something because I got to read that short story for sure now. Black suffering. So our modern day lynching videos, and I know some folks have argued with me and say, well, the examples are not the same, but I would say, you know, it's about terrorism. 
these videos that are played over and over again of violence against the black body from police from white and others who are empowered by the state to hurt and kill black people with impunity. You know, now I guess CNN has a whole like slew of videos from the young brother being choked at the prom. You got the Waffle House. You got the young sisters at the Airbnb with the helicopters and the cops. You go down the list, the Yale University incident. So I'm like, on some level, do you think black pain is seductive? And not just in terms of the white gaze, and this will sound provocative to some, but maybe in terms of thinking about the black popular imagination as well, because I'm struggling with that as like an ontological matter. How do we understand black suffering and are people seduced by it? That's a very serious question. Yeah, isn't it? I've been struggling with it. I don't know. I'm afraid of the answer. I think I do know. I'm afraid of the answer. See, I think that you have to rephrase. That has to do with issues of representations of black suffering, not black suffering itself. And representations of suffering in general, conventional expectations of representations of suffering. And so I agree with you, there is something that is aesthetically pleasing about representations of black suffering. Now, the question is, when you see this, do you connect with it? Do you connect with it with the human capacity for empathy? Are we really empathizing with the tortured black body? Or has it moved us to this kind of aesthetic mode? This is a complicated question. I had this little pet peeve, and this isn't that, you know, I like to say this too much because my literary theory friends always tell me I don't know what I'm talking about, right? Because it's Paul DeMann, who is probably one of the most important deconstructionist thinkers. He brings to us the work of somebody like Walter Benjamin. DeMann was also this ex-Nazi. But there's a statement in his work where he talks about suffering as a linguistic phenomenon, the suffering of the text, the instability of translation. The thing that I'm concerned about is, is this sort of abstraction of human suffering. And that's a real issue in our virtual world where people don't really empathize anymore with suffering. They don't feel it because it occurs on this abstract visual plane. And so it's just, you're talking about something that we see. And so my concern is, how do we move from seeing into feeling? You know, I teach at St. Louis University. We used to have a professor here, uh, Walter Alm, who had taught me when I was a kid. His work really tries to deal with kind of epistemology of human sense perception. And it's sort of interesting, the word feeling, like we think of feeling as a sentiment, but what about feeling as a sense perception? We're talking about the sense of touch, right? And so we believe that feeling is a sentiment, and so if it exists in the realm of what Ong would call hypervisualism, or some people call ocular centrism, but we can at least just say virtual reality, because that's what we're all dealing with. You and I are virtually connected, and so we have this whole inter internet world of things being done in this sort of site-based way, and it's abstracted away from the body, the feeling, touching human body. Some of the things that enable this are synesthetic tricks of cinema that make you feel like your body is more engaged than it actually is, but all you're doing is looking at something and hearing something. This is all extracted away from actually smelling something, tasting something, and literally touching something. Because, you know, the sense of touch can't be abstracted. You have to be next to something to touch it, to feel it. And so what interests me is, like, particularly within black aesthetic work, is how we get outside the grammar of representation. See, that's the thing about the minstrel show. The minstrel show is all about reflections and representation. It all is about, it, you could actually think about it in terms of this sort of post structuralist sense, you know, it's all about signified, signifier split, which is so grounded in Western epistemology. And so the question is, is there another way of knowing the world more based in our bodies and not just in our eyeballs and seeing things, more based in feeling, touching. My sort of uh, preoccupation is with Black Atlantic art that is not representational, but the thing in and of itself. When you hear, again, like I said, we don't want to sound like two old heads who have thought, especially you, so, so, so deeply about these issues. So when you hear some younger activist scholars and the like howling about representation in popular culture, or howling about intersectionality. When I talk to these brothers and sisters, some of them are very, very smart. I'm like, when you say representation, what do you mean? What is the political work that is being done by these images? When you're just sort of using this language, what are you actually trying to say? I mean, when you hear those terms thrown around, especially intersectionality, what is your response? 
Because representation often is a couch in terms of like political representation. I, I joke with my students at the beginning of class because I want them to introduce themselves. They say, oh, yeah, I used to do it on the, you know, black radio shows, you know, represent, you know, what's your name, what's your name, what's your name, you know, what's your sign, you know, represent, present at the table, having a place at the table. And so that's very much connected to these, this notion of sort of minority politics and very much connected to the notion of identity politics. My good friend, dislikes me talking about identity politics because people are so disdainful of the idea of identity politics. And he says, yeah, because it's always identity politics when it comes to black folks, but you're talking about white identity politics, right? That notion of representation and identity is this idea of interest group politics. And so one of the problems with it is, is that through interest group politics, you play into the grammar, for example, of blackness being just another interest group. And if you're playing interest group politics, you can be denied. There's certain issues I don't think are interest because I don't think the environment is an interest group. I don't think whatever it is that the African-American, the descendant of enslaved Africans in American society is, they're not an interest group. There might be some interest groups. You the gun lobby? Yeah, like a drug company or something like that, or the NRA might be an interest group. But that's very much divorced from issues of rights, uh, issues of morality which I think are connected to that. The other question you have about intersectionality. <laughs> intersectionality is fascinating because students like to throw it around, but again, it becomes like sort of interest, you know, identity politics defined as interest group. Everybody has their own particular interest. And intersectionality really is about, no, these are not particular interest groups. We are all fighting patriarchal oppression. And so we really need to, to understand this issue of patriarchal of oppression as affecting all of us. So this is part of what racism is about. This is part of what sexism is about. And the truth is, we can't have these conversations in a vacuum. They have to be connected to economic justice. They have to be, this is hard to say, in any kind of popular form because, you know, I used to be a newspaper reporter. And I remember writing stories, and I was asked to write some stories about environmental racism. And I went and I found this Marxist activist in the community, interviewed him at length. While I was leaving, he said, man, you know, they're not going to use the word I said. And I said, no, nah, man, this is another day. I'm a black reporter. I'm going to get you in there. <laughs> and <laughs> see, you laugh. <laughs> he was right. <laughs> they purged him. And you know what? They purged him not even intentionally. Because what happens is you can have a view that's as reactionary that is as right-wing as is humanly possible, and we're constantly exposed to anti-human views in the press. But you can't really publish in mainstream media, and I would even say a lot of alternative media, a serious anti-capitalist position. It's usually presented to us that anti-capitalist positions are associated with Stalinist, Leninist, communism, and they have been discredited. But any kind of real intersectional position truly has to, you have to give it up and embrace an anti-capitalist critique. You just can't get on your corporate jet, pretend like you are really about transforming our society. It's fun because I just, you know, go back to my newspaper days. I just want to talk about the high point of my career, right? I worked at the New Orleans Times Picayune in New Orleans. In many ways, it's a high point of my career because I had never felt more effective than I felt when I was a reporter who was asked to participate in the stories on race in America. And I think this connects with some of what you were saying about the representation, right, and the images of African Americans. So I was asked to work on this group of stories, and every race package I'd ever seen in the newspaper was boring as hell. <laughs> the most interesting topic affecting Americas in the city, and all these all the newspapers wrote about it was boring. I'm talking about a long time ago. This is back in 1991 or so. And so anyway, they just wanted to do a series of stories about race. Now, the interesting thing is, it's a really amazing brother. He's with NPR now. Keith Woods had just become city editor. He said he wanted to do something different. Me, I had come into journalism after having done graduate work in political science and after having befriended some of the most brilliant brothers I'd ever met. I made an argument that we could not write about race if we didn't write about history. And not just history, but the complicity of our own newspaper in racial oppression. They let me write on slavery in New Orleans, which was just something you didn't do in a newspaper, write history, you know, historical perspective and stuff like that. 
But at the end of the package, another editor uh, gathered us all together in a circle, or Grant gathered the sort of the point reporters in a circle and said, okay, now, because the picky had never won a Pulitzer Prize up to that point. And she said, okay, now, so we need to write a, a solution. Every Pulitzer Prize winning package has a series of solutions. And so we were all talking all these platitudes about solutions to the race problem, right? I just felt that this was my moment. I just had to, so I kind of slammed my hand down on the table. You were dramatic. You were ready. <laughs> I was dramatic, man. If we're not talking about the fundamental economic restructuring of the United States, then we're not serious. And she, she, she looked at me and smiled and said, of course we're not going to do that. So I just <laughs> sat down to my place at the table. Part of what, what the issue about intersectionality is you can't take that lightly. Intersectionality means genuine sacrifice to some extent of our privileges in the most advanced capitalist society in the world that's laying waste to the rest of the world. After uh, 9-11, you know, uh, George Bush says our way of life is under attack, you know. You look at people in the rest of the world, you know, it's like I tell students this all the time. I dare them to find anything in the classroom that's made in America. And then I ask them, why is that? Now, I want to tell you that in relationship to that, if I taught courses in the, the prison here in Missouri, when I ask the same question <laughs> of the people in prison, they look around and say, well, just about everything, they were made in prison. You know, that's made in America, right? But we have to be willing to surrender. It's not just privilege based on uh, gender or privilege based on race, you know. It's privilege based on class. It's privilege based, based on our standing in the world right now. We really have to look at this world right now and realize we can't continue to live like this. Connections there, the prophets, and I've done this in lectures and workshops too, questions of human rights and human dignity, right? Responsibility. And not necessarily, I don't present it as anti-capitalism because, you know, they don't want to hear that. But let's talk about empathy. I say, you know, where do the rare earth metals in your cell phone come from? Right. You like to drink Lipton tea. Where's that tea come from? You wear in these clothes that probably cost a penny to produce and they charge you 200 bucks for them pair of jeans you're wearing. Well, who's making that? And thinking about how we profit from human suffering. And that's the, the responsibility. And then I ask them, then I'm like, well, you're going to give up your cell phone so our brothers and sisters in Africa, South Asia and elsewhere don't die? And not a, one out of hand goes up because other people's suffering... Of course we're not going to do that. You said something really, you know, on point there about George Bush. And the second thing Bush said in terms of sort of resistance, if we're thinking about the confusion of capitalism and democracy and freedom, that conflation, is go out and shop. That's the resistant act after 9-11. We can't continue to live like this. It's kind of weird, man. I've been, de you know, I've been developing this sort of hidden theory about Donald Glover because uh, one of the things that's interesting about him is he was raised a Jehovah's Witness. You know, looking at his video, This is America, there's even scenes, there's even apocalyptic scenes in it. And it's this idea of, you know, almost living at the end of time. And I don't know an apocalypse of, you know, Armageddon or the apocalypse of white that that can no longer sustain us. It will not sustain whatever it is we want to call white people. It will not sustain these people who are ruining the planet. Whiteness is no longer sustainable as an idea. But this, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe in, you know, like we're living at the end of days, if I understand them correctly. And, you know, Michael Jackson was one, too. Maybe I'm stretching it too far. Because so you have millenarianists, you know, eschatological perspective. But it's not just them thinking about, you know, the crisis of capitalism, the forces that elected Donald Trump. That's about death anxieties. That's about whiteness. And there's some really interesting research. You probably saw this. came out a few years ago about it's uh, called mortality salience. You know, the other psychologists call it terror management theory. And what they discovered was with experiments that white folks, when you stimulate their anxieties about death, they're much more tolerant of racism. And they actually become much more racist in their attitudes towards people of color. Well, that's sort of interesting because I kind of think about if I had actually written about this somewhere. I gave a presentation on this. Sociologists refer to this as categorical panic. The first place where I encountered it was in this book called Discourse and Destruction on the bombing of MOVE in Philadelphia. The writer that I do most of my work on is John Edgar Wideman, and he wrote this book called Philadelphia Fire. But I don't know if you remember the bombing of MOVE in 1985 or know anything about it, but uh, this uh, sociologist said that what caused the bombing was what she called categorical panic. But the people who moved in that row house back to nature, they wore dreadlocks, but, you know, they'd go running you know, at five o'clock in the morning and nobody knew how to process them. 
And when people encounter that panic, they have to somehow get a hold on it. And that's where she says, that's where the violence grew out of that desire. I think of that panic as what I call epistemological panic. And the way that I understand epistemology, at least as a literature professor, is to this word narrative, is to this word fiction, that we have this chaotic world and fiction processes it and orders it for us, uh, gives us a sense of who we are and where we are. And the one that I was writing about was Katrina in New Orleans, that people are watching these images and all Americans believe we live in the greatest country in the world, that if shit goes wrong, that Calvary is going to come in and, and save us and all that. What happened was, is we were watching an American city, and I don't think we've really seen that before then, falling apart in front of our very eyes, and there was no response. People standing on their roofs, begging for water. The floodwaters just coming in, unstoppable. Water surging through levees. It was just falling apart. And it was, I think, when people watched this, it affected a crisis in them about who they were and where they, where they were. In moments of epistemological crisis, what happens? What happened in New Orleans was, is people sought a comforting narrative. They sought a reassuring narrative that told them who they were and where they were. And almost immediately, you had newspaper reports, television reports, even Oprah. I remember Oprah flew down, flew down to the Superdome. And she's standing at the door of the Superdome in a national cars and said, you don't want to go in there. Black savagery, dystopian black savagery. They're eating each other. They're raping children. They're murdering people. And that's the same narrative that I mentioned in the article that I wrote, Birth of a Nation. It's the same narrative about, you know, like you're saying, barbarians at the gate, the savages looting. They show pictures of looting. People were floating in the water, dead, dying. And that's all they wanted to focus on was black criminality. Why? Because that's a reassuring narrative, not compared to the narrative of the ineptness of the national government response that it couldn't save a city from destruction. This is essentially, you know, what we learned from Stuart Hall is how these narratives organize our world for us. And we definitely, I mean, that's some of the most important work that we can do is dismantling these kinds of narratives that organize our world in oppressive ways. That's all they want to talk about in New Orleans. And I was kind of proud because that Picayune, where I worked in the race series, it won, I think, Pulitzer Prizes for its coverage of that. And one of the best stories that I had seen was, you remember all that looting, raping, and murdering that you read about in the paper? <laughs> it didn't happen. It was amazing because if... The people who were there inside the Superdome, I remember one woman being interviewed, she said it was like the civil rights movement. People were coming together. I don't know why it's so important in the American narrative, and I think it's almost specifically an American narrative, that if civil law breaks down, then you have barbarism. Other countries don't constantly rehearse that narrative like us, that somehow human beings are these savages that need to be constantly contained with brute force. And that probably gets to the myths of the frontier and hyper-individualism and gun culture, because if the state fails, and also sort of anti-statism, right, especially if you're thinking about sort of white conservatives and the way that, quote-unquote, big government, any idea of the state itself is viewed as being dangerous, a threat to liberty. You know, think about the American democratic project and American democracy. Well, black folks, and to a lesser degree other people of color, but especially black Americans, we're constructed as the anti-citizen. We are not proper democratic subjects. And then the glue that binds it together is anti-blackness and then a belief in the inherent rationality and goodness of whiteness and white people as being full and proper democratic subjects. So you have that contradiction. So if you talk about instead of black savagery, black community, or even if you think about reconstruction, right, the, This especially in this moment, these lies about the Confederacy and these fights in the 21st century about these horrible monuments – that, well, if we talk about Reconstruction as a triumph of democracy and look at all that black people accomplished in the South that expanded democracy even for poor white people, well, then that goes right in the spits right in the face of the lies of films like Birth of a Nation. Absolutely. It's like the uh, African-American, I guess, the, the issue of guilt versus innocent, that we have done something wrong. But also, if you believe that we human beings are not savages, all the uh, justifications for slavery and oppression fall away. 
you know, there was a whole myth of the slaves in the pre-Jim Crow era, but in the uh, post-Jim Crow era, you know, it's a, you know, suddenly the black person becomes this menacing, dangerous threat that has to be contained. Now, what did you think about Django Unchained and Tarantino's work in general? <laughs> I didn't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I really haven't seen it, man. Was that a matter of principle, or you just don't like Tarantino because he's a professional Negrophile? I don't really know if he's a Negrophile or not. I don't quite know what he is. You know, I just have problems with a certain aspect of uh, of American entertainment that's just about just murder. The fact that we find such entertainment in that, that's one of the amazing things about This Is America. He races through the video and deliberately uses the plot to prevent us from concentrating on the horrors. And that's sort of the way American cinema is. I have problems, you know, with Tarantino. I have problems with uh, Francis Ford Coppola. When I think about Godfather films, it's kind of interesting. He also wrote Patton, sort of Patton helps to create a certain myth of American exceptionalism and our greatness of World War II and that kind of thing. And also, too, in Patton, the hyper-visibility of the black body in that film with his personal assistant. You know, I've wondered about that cat. <laughs> he's always there serving him. You know, he's like this gentle soul. Yeah. Uh, Paul almost single-handedly, man. There's this movie... The Act of Killing or The Art of Killing or something oh, like yes, that. Oh, yes, I saw it. Oh, man, devastating. And uh, when you listen to what some of those guys say, these are hitmen, and they say, you know, we were imitating the gangsters from the movies. Just understanding the impact of what I mean by these representations, the understanding through somebody like Stuart Hall, how these things contain ideology and they construct the way that we process our worlds, man. And they've had such a profound, such a horrifically profound impact on the American imagination. And so that's where I see that's the role of art is to liberate our imagination from that kind of crap. War on Terror, you just look at it, it was, you know, first of all, it plays out entertainment. And then that entertainment moves into real life. But thinking, too, about we got to think about loneliness and this culture of celebrity and hyper-reality. Think about this whole debate with Kanye West, which I thought was one of the most absurd, silly things I've ever seen. Because Kanye West does not exist. Kanye West is a, is a creation. He's a character, right? He's a character. Yeah, and you're imbuing him with all They're this. Kind of Donald Trump. Yeah, Donald Trump is a character, but he's actually dangerous. Now, certainly we can talk about Kanye and the black freedom struggle and the role of sort of the black sycophants, white supremacy, all these things against anti-intellectualism. But for me to sit there and as I'm curious about your response to somebody, as I said, who thinks critically about media, media aesthetics, to watch folks engage these shadows. And I wrote on Twitter, I wrote a piece about it for Salon. I'm like, Kanye don't exist, people. We got to include Donald Trump in that. He is dangerous. He is dangerous, but he's made, I mean, the thing is, he's a character to himself, and all of Donald Trump is about is his own brand. And what do you see? What you see Kanye doing is, is what everybody else around Donald Trump is doing, and what Donald Trump is doing to everybody else. They're all using this phenomenon to build their brand. So Kanye just says, oh, you know, you know, just, you know that's what he's doing. I mean, look, there's no bigger brand, no bigger group of people who have no real substance in the kardashian they're famous for being famous that's the very definition of celebrity and i mean even the language of the brand if we really want to be critical scholars thinking in terms of marxism and a critique of neoliberalism that individuals joe q public right who are socially atomized who are lonely their only claim to quote unquote fame is facebook or some fake followers on twitter even listen to the little kids talk about i'm a brand Talk about the triumph of loneliness and capitalist consumption and that sort of logic. That you're not a human being first, you're a brand and a brand on the internet. And that gives you meaning. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why people feel a betrayal with Kanye, though. Because Kanye is a talented brother. <laughs> and see, that's the thing is the rest of them are brands, right? It's all surface. But the thing about it is, is that this brother, he does have a true talent, you know? He's not just there. He's not famous for being famous. He actually did something. He would be nobody if he didn't have any talent. Unlike the Kardashians who were married to somebody or married into somebody or had a father who got famous by knowing uh, O.J. Simpson who actually did something. And they made a sex video. Directed by the mother. People forget that. That the mother was there. She watched the video. And then said it wasn't, quote, unquote, sexy enough and redo it. And the mother was right in terms of making her daughter a star. Capitalism as a system of knowing, as a system of knowledge, 
It's not. It's an economic system for <laughs> moving goods around. But now we think of it as a system of meaning, and it's not. Exactly like you're saying, it cannot provide meaning. It's all hollow if we don't have some system, some way of having meaning. It's so different from other systems, you know, whether it's a religious system or what have you, that give fundamental meaning to our lives. We have something where all we're doing is, is that we're projecting ourselves out as these objects in the world that have value in terms of a monetary value. And we all are sort of like, you know, I like your you know, use of the word. It's just, it's all hollow. It cannot provide the meaning that we seek. And people just ignore the fact that they don't want to deal with the fact that it seems dangerous that, to them to see that a lot of these people that they want to call Islamic fundamentalists or terrorists, you know, you look at them and they're, you know, some of these kids more recently grew up in France. You know, they had all the bling that they wanted, went through the prison system, and they were recruited from the prison system the way Malcolm X was recruited from the prison system, by a system that offered meaning to them, that offered place to them, where nothing else around us does. The religious system, it gave them a narrative of who they were, it gave them a narrative of where they came from, it gave them a sense of belonging to something. One of the things about Islam that is, is really powerful is the prayers, you know, five times a day facing Mecca and it gives you an imagination of a whole society that's doing the same thing at the same time, a sense of belonging. And it gives you a certain sense of being that's not just about buying a bunch of crap. It says something else, too, in terms of thinking about capitalism and, uh, in this case, thinking about ISIS, politicized Islam, radical religion, is that capitalism is futility. It's destruction. And that's how capitalism works. You can never keep up with the next consumer good. It's planned obsolescence. Absolutely. I just read an article. I don't know if you saw this. I wish I can give you the reference for it. Oh, it's Zizek who wrote it, actually. Because <laughs> Zizek was talking about the final stage of capitalism and the assumptions of communism that in the final stage of capitalism, there would be some being there who could rebuild society. And there's sort of this assumption of a core where communism, or I guess people would call it, I guess, vulgar communism or materialism, one of the things is materialism asserts the absence of a core. And so what you have is, it's just complete this system, and I agree with you 100%, it just, Mark says, it sows the seeds of its own destruction, and we are in the final stages of that, because it is, I mean, we could see just with Donald Trump, the nihilism is just astounding. And for anybody to think that he cares about any other capitalist besides just himself and maybe a couple of people in his family, they have to be mistaken. He, he wants to take everything. So I was out yesterday. And I was sitting in the park, one of the nice days here in Chicago before it began raining again. To a brother and a sister walk by, high school age, maybe the freshman or sophomores in college. You know when you get older, everybody seems younger? And they were arguing and discussing adamantly Childish Gambino's new movie, This Is America. And you wrote that great piece. Why is that movie, rather, why is that video, why is it resonating so much? I've heard people at the barbershop, on the bus, and now out in the park talking about it. When you talk about the body, why is he occurring that half naked? We're trying to break through the spell, right? We're trying to break through this spell. And so the one way of breaking through the spell is, is by trying to get us back in touch with our bodies. So the other thing is, is that he's like, for me, I think he's almost channeling Michael Jackson. You know, look at his moves. These are Michael Jackson moves, but look at his face. His face has these expressions of writhing pain. And so one of the things that he is doing, it's what I think is really amazing is that Charles Gambino himself, he's brilliant at pastiche. You know, I don't think he's the greatest rapper in the world, but he's really good at, at doing what other rappers do as well as they do it. And so he's sampling all these other rappers. He has all these various dance moves, and you've never really seen anybody move like that in these moves that usually should be joy, but they're writhing pain. It reminds me of the scene you remember uh, Invisible Man, Brother Todd Clifton? You know, he was this brilliant, beautiful black American activist who gets broken by this sort of group called the Brotherhood that's supposed to be like communists. And the main character of Invisible Man sees Brother Todd on the street with uh, black sambo dolls that he's making them dance on the street for him. And there's this idea, if you see Donald Glover, he's almost moving like this magical Sambo doll, you know, doing all these moves that we're so used to being entertained by, but there's no entertainment on his face. It is a brilliant work of art. I guess I can't explain why people 
are drawn into it other than that he has taken advantage of this phenomenon. He has put it out there. And it's great black art. Or I would say great black Atlantic art. Right. And what I mean by great black Atlantic art is part of what's going on and it it's not representation. Like, but I was blown away, man. A lot of people think of Pan-Africanism as dead and he's using these African children. He's using this African. Yeah. When I was watching the video, I was thinking, man, Brother Herskovitz, I was thinking about Africanism in the New World, in the, in the Black Atlantic and his movement and the dancing and saying, do you think folks are responding? Never mind. It's, it's great art. And we certainly got to define some terms, you know, in terms of how you and I talk about the Black and Black popular culture like Brother Hall, because I think that's important in the Black Atlantic. Do you think people are surprised that you could have a Black artist who makes something, you said the use of pastiche, foreground and background, his director is brilliant that for some folks, they're just surprised that you'd see a young, relatively young black man, he's 30 or so, who's, again, a polymath, he's a renaissance man, making, you know, ideologically rich in a very intentional way art. Because that's part of me, I was like, sometimes I'm happy people are excited, and part of me is like, do you think black folks are stupid? But, but you know, that's almost always been done by children. Miles Davis, child, or Charlie Parker's a child, the greatest art has often been done by children. I compare Charles Gambino to me, or, or Donald Glover to me, he's the Basquiat of this generation. And that is, when you watch Basquiat paint, there's sort of an effortless fluency in the symbolic language that he works with, right? I mean, it's just like, there's just, he's just like, it's like a knife through butter. There's just, Glover has that suppleness, that intellectual suppleness. But I want to get outside of the language of representation because people think of these things as representative as opposed to things that have kind of a, a spiritualizing force that much more like black Atlantic objects. You know, structured like, you know, you were talking about Herskovit, the, the whole Black Atlantic feel, the whole bringing in this notion of diaspora, bringing in this notion of Pan-Africanism, connecting to Africa, bringing in African children. And then, you know, the, the, the refrain, yeah, 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 go away. Uh, I mentioned this brilliant novel, Ishmael Reed. And Ishmael Reed says, I'm not imitating Western sources. I'm writing out of my own tradition, I'm writing out of my own culture. This is not trying to be a novel the way Western novels are novels. This is not a novel. You know, he has this thing, the Neo-Hoodoo Manifesto. This is Neo-Hoodoo. My, he says, my 10 is my chicken foot. And it's like getting outside the economy representation where these are actual things. Things are going on. And, you know, it's like, go away. The, you know, Mumbo Jumbo, Ishmael Reed says, comes from a Malinke word, making the troubled spirits of ancestors go away. And it's like almost taking the voice of Africa. Right now, man, Africa is under siege, man. You know, Blackwater and Air, United States has this major presence in Africa. The plans to sort of recolonize this continent by China, by America, by all these people are moving in because it's so resource rich in a new way. And he makes this document that has this refrain, go away. They're <laughs> seeing it sung by these African children all in there. And you feel this. Is, and I hate to say this because I'm not a Tarantino fan, but I like talking about Tarantino to my students who are Tarantino. Because most of my students who saw Pulp Fiction didn't understand it the first time they saw it. And they went to go see it again. And I said, okay, how come you don't give the same kind of attention to a work of literature? If you don't understand it the first time, what moves you to go see it again? And Glover, man, and the, he's doing that. And, and the most beautiful thing about it is, unlike Tarantino, who really supports sociopathic consciousness, Glover is actually trying to support something that is meaningful, trying to do something that really is about returning us to ourselves, man, you know, engaging, feeling. Like deconstruct. Like one scene, right? So, because you wrote about this. So you have Glover slash Childish Gambino parroting, subverting, aping, and I use that word intentionally, the image, the caricature of Jim Crow, right? Jumping Jim Crow, Jim Crow, however you want to, you know, trace the origins of that phrase. And then he pulls out the pistol and he kills the man. So in that one scene, I mean, how would you deconstruct it? As I said, you know, as a scholar of literature, somebody who understands sort of, you know, the semiotics of that moment. 
A lot of it is already there in what you just said. Of course, it is uh, trying to break with the thing that I was talking of the relentlessness of the menstrual representation that no matter what, black performers always seem like menstruals to white viewers. He's foregrounding that. The other thing, though, is he has put those hooded figures in his TV show Atlanta, too. And of course, those hooded figures, we know them, man. We know them from Abu Ghraib. We know them from the war on terror. And we're complicit in that regime of torture, right? So he's also foregrounding that in this issue of American violence. You know, it's like I was trying to say, he's trying to get on one level, what I see going on in his work is making us conscious. And this is what you're saying about when you're talking about the love that the Trump voter feels for Trump. They're under a spell. How do you break the spell? It's not just going to be through telling people you're under a spell, you're crazy. Make, that makes the spell more powerful. At some point in time, the person has to see himself being seen and has to break out of thinking that he's a character and return to him or herself. This is what I try to call white double consciousness. <laughs> it's, you know, white people becoming aware of themselves as being crazy as hell and that this country's crazy. You know, this is a surreal place. How do you get people to become aware of that, to engage in that? You know, it's like people always present black double consciousness as something wrong with black people. Maybe white people need to be double conscious in the same way and see themselves through the eyes of others. Does the Trump voter, can he actually see himself the way he's being seen by the rest of the world? Sort of, it seems like they're striding and they don't care, but they obviously think that there's something beautiful or noble about it as opposed to insane and destructive. But I'm thinking, you know, about the L.A. riots, right, and the brutal beating of Rodney King. Judith Butler talking about white racial paranoia, white racial paranoiac thinking. What's going on morally and ethically? And when I say white, I mean capital W white. When you can have these images of black bodies, brown bodies being abused, beaten, destroyed, but somehow it's their own fault. Somehow they're threatening. Somehow they had it coming. And that's when I say, you know, I'm very concerned about the recuperative power of these videos of violence against a black body, because the white spectator, those who deeply invested whiteness consciously or subconsciously, somehow it's always going to be the black person's fault, the brown person's fault, because they're so allied with state power and psychologically invested in violence against black people. I think that works if you only see them as representations. And I think that, that when you're talking about these videos, that works. But when they're not representations, and that's, that's the one thing I think that people are trying to make sense of, this is America. I don't think it's a representation of something. I get this from, the again, the writer that I work on, John Edgar Wyden, and he just, he just put out a book, Writing to Save a Life, and it's the Lewis Till file. It's on Emma Till's father, who was uh, hanged in, in uh, Italy for war crimes, for rape and murder. But uh, Wyden really, his work changed after his son was in prison for murder. And he's the one who brought me to this book called Flash of the Spirit by uh, Robert Ferris Thompson, which is, you know, it's an exposition of our African cosmology in the, in the new world. But the one thing is to think about sort of aesthetic work is not necessarily being engaged in the same kind of efforts as Western or European work is, particularly when it comes to this idea of representation. You know, we're just seeing an image of something. And the question is, is it just an image or does it or can it be something in and of itself to, to this is America? It's not just representing things. There's something else going on. It's not just about, look, it doesn't come together. It doesn't come together in a conventional narrative. How do you make sense of the ending of the film? Is it just fantasy? And he's trying to sort of be he's in he's part of the narrative and he's apart from it but he still can't escape the violence against the black body even if he's the protagonist quote unquote or the narrator the image on its own just of those white eyes and the dark field just that by itself that conveys all the meaning that you want you don't have to position it within a narrative you know it's about that moment man it's about that image and what does it what effect does it have do you need to ensconce it in a story? Okay, is this the runaway slave? It's kind of interesting uh, looking at the people behind them. They're all running too. And I don't think they're chasing him. They're all running. You know, I thought there would be cops back there. I didn't see any cops back there. They're all running from existential dread or they're all running from the madness of America? They're all, I just think they're running. And, and also, I mean, it's like you look, Cannot you were talking about intertextuality also. What about the intertextual notion of this is Donald Glover? This is 
childish Gambino. This is that, per- and it's he's not just pretending to be somebody. This is him. That's him. He's breaking through that boundary, not just pretending to be a character. He's not pretending to be a character. He is himself. And that's the thing that's really bothering everything about this little cat who's in community, you know, who's childish Gambino, who's smiling, and who speaks, you know, uh, very, very standardized English and stuff like that. That he is trying to, re- he's revealing himself. He's, I mean, he's all but naked. You know, in the film, you know, presenting his own body as a real body. He's trying to break through into our world. They would call it like in theater, it's bearing the device or whatever, would ever sort of implicate the the body of the spectator, brings the spectator into it, the real spectator, the real spectator's mind. So I, and I also compare it like the Toni Morrison debate about what's going on. Toni Morrison talks about rememory. And she creates these fragmented narratives. And so what has to happen is these fragmented narratives, like Beloved, about enslavement. And so she created this fragmented narrative about enslavement. And she knows that Americans have only processed slavery through Gone with the Wind and these sentimentalist narratives of happy plantations. And she has to break through that into whatever really slavery was. Americans remember it in this, you know, through Gone with the Wind. So she creates her own act of what she calls rememory. And so you take, you know, this idea of memory, members, fragments, different bits and pieces. So you have this piece, broken up narrative that we as readers have to piece together in order for it to make sense. And in piecing it together, we become active participants in the production of memory, of remembering. And so she brings us into it. So that breaks through. That breaks through our passivity. That breaks through it as spectators. We have we have entered into this, and that is some of the sort of the pain uh, that we process of reading this novel. What fascinates me about Glover is he's trying to process for us Michael Jackson. <laughs> that dude was all about pain, and we ignored it. Literal pain, and that's the pain that killed him, Your brother Michael. One promise before we wind down, you tell folks if you're so inclined where to find you online, emails, etc. Because I know you got to go to a meeting and I'm sitting here just smiling. We got so much to talk about. So you got to make a promise. We do a part two and we just talk about prior and black comedy and the African-American tradition of humor because we got to come back for a part two. So at some point we'll be able to do that. <laughs> that cat is so bad. Of course, I love. I see, you know, man, what happened is, is that years ago after reading uh, Brown's book on uh, Richard Pryor's Berkeley years, I tried to write something about it. Because I tried to write something about what Pryor did, actually, to slice through that wall. And it is related to suffering, right? What messed me up rewatching his concert videos was it was a long catalog of pain. But you never, it was never pathetic. It was never conventional pain. Um, it was, he, he found a language of communicating pain. And this is the thing that I think is really important. True suffering or true pain doesn't have a language. See, this is uh, L. Scary's book, The Body and Pain. You know, even when Dr. Hey, you were read my mind. I actually have that book right here. You read my mind. And that pain does not exist within language. And so within this dynamic of the signified and signifier, it's resistant to representation. Pain comes to us connected to bodies. And that's what I was trying to get at earlier when I talk about touching, feeling, the body, concreteness, you know, whatever it is that we are, because we're all under the spell of the society of the spectacle. We're all under the spell of the signified signifier, <laughs> you know, this 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 the, the fictional circuit of the letter, we're all caught up in that. You know, we've become unreal to ourselves. You know, it's like Ishmael Reed says he wants to return characters back into fiction where they belong. You know, we're not characters. And, and so how do you get at that? And that is to the, you know, when we talk about the body, because people sort of invoke the body without really trying to figure out, well, what is the body? Because, you know, outside of this symbolic regimen, what is this body outside of this hypervisualist culture where everything can be reduced to something seen, something that's objectified, something that commodity and consumable. Yeah, when we do our part two, we got to talk about, like I said, we got pain because the other part of pain, and this connects so much we've been talking about with violence and this police thuggery brutality. This is America. I mean, it's a thread throughout all of this. Black pleasure and black joy and how are those radical acts 
that a certain type of white racial authoritarian authoritarianism has to emulate, has to destroy, because to see black bodies in pleasure and joy is just too much to handle, especially if it's joy outside of the white gaze. It's all mumbo jumbo. Ishmael Reed's book, Mumbo Jumbo. He creates this whole new history of the West, man, where he says started with Seth, who couldn't dance, and Osiris, who could dance. And Seth got jealous of Osiris. And so you have this whole long history of the West of descendant of Seth, which he calls the eightness of the one, and then the descendants of Osiris, these people who, you know, enjoy the black mud sound. He talks about his descendants are these, these embraces of Jeff's groom, this joy uh, this uh, of living, right? And, this, and, he, and it's all for him, for Reed, it's like this religious holy war, right? <laughs> Where the Atonists are trying to suppress the people of Jeff's groom. Crazy, man, especially his structure. It's a crazy book, man. Reed Trip. A random anecdote. I saw Richard Pryor in Atlantic City, his one of his last performances before he died. I'll never forget it. I and mean, he was on the stage. He did a whole. I mean, God, he was such a genius. He pretended to die on stage, oh, and he just sat that. there. <laughs> yeah, on the, in the wheelchair, he put his head down, and it had to be ten minutes. It wasn't after people thought he fell asleep, and he pops up and he says, "You thought I was dead, huh?" And he goes into this meditation on death. Oh, that's some brilliant shit, man. That's brilliant. So what he actually did, like you thought, he brought your time into his time, didn't he? It's like this anxiety, nothing going on, you know, why doesn't he move, all that, man. It's like, uh, I don't know, like like John Cage's performance, what was it, where he, uh, where, the, where the musicians come out uh, on stage and uh, they don't play for like three minutes. But it is what, that's another, this is the way where Richard Pryor was brilliant. He found a way to break through the spell, you know? To break through the trance, to undermine, you know, uh, our zombieism. That's that's amazing. I wish I'd, I'd never seen him live, man. That's a real gift. I want to thank Brother Stephen one more time. I love that part where he said the best art the genius is made by the children. And also that great story he told about being at the gym, hearing those older white folks talking about crimes against property. They don't care about crimes against people. We see that across American society. Why do they write? 